Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm sorry I disappeared for so long. This has been a crazy last six months or so, but I am back. And I think I'm going to take my channel in a little bit different direction. I'm still going to review movies, but I'm probably going to expand and review all movies because I'm just a movie lover. And also, something I never actually shared with you guys is that I'm a huge Stranger Things fan. It is my favorite show ever. I'm actually not much of a TV guy. I don't watch a lot of series. I've watched a few throughout my life, but compared to a lot of people, I really don't watch any TV shows, Netflix shows, anything like that. But I love Stranger Things, and we are ultimately <laughs> getting a Stranger Things Season 5, and I want to be prepared for that. Like, I want my channel to be prepared for that. And I want you guys to have a collection of videos that you can go back to when that drops so that you're all caught up with how I feel about the show, where, they, where each season ranks, how I feel about the characters. So over the next couple of weeks, I'm probably going to be putting out a bunch of Stranger Things content, maybe even the next month. It just depends on how my schedule goes. But, but I definitely wanted to make you guys aware of that. So... You're not caught off guard and thinking that I'm only going to be covering Stranger Things. And I'm actually going to try to put some other videos in there. I've got a few other video ideas like some top tens and a couple more reviews. But I'm going to devote the next month mostly to Stranger Things. And to kick this entire thing off, I thought I would do a ranking video of all four seasons. That way you guys know exactly where each season ranks. And then when season five comes out, I can just update it. But that being said... I'm going to do this ranking, so let's go ahead and get into it. So before I even get into this ranking, one thing that I would like to clarify and make perfectly clear is that I love all four seasons of this show. Like even my least favorite is still a four out of five or better. So <laughs> the difference in quality for each season, for me anyways, is like a razor thin difference. So do not take the ranking to heart. Don't take the number placement to heart. Just know that I love every single season. I don't even look at my last place as being the worst of the series. I just look at it as being the fourth best. But now that that's all out of the way, coming in at number four is Stranger Things Season 2. Like I said, guys, I love every season. Each season is basically perfect to me, but if I had to pick a number four, it would have to be the second season. And, and there's actually a couple of reasons for this, but before I get into the reasons why it does come in last, let me tell you a few of the things that I really love about it. I do want to start out with some positives because there are a lot of good things about this second season. For one it did do the sequel thing correct. It went bigger. It expanded the lore and made the universe bigger. We got Sean Astin from The Goonies as Bob. He was an awesome character, and spoiler alert, we were all sad to see him go. He was a great addition to the show, and I felt like it was a very good move to bring in a Goonies character, considering that this show does mimic or should I say mirror that movie in a lot of ways, in the best way possible. That is not a bad thing. I love the way this show pays homage to all of those 80s and early 90s classics like It or The Goonies or Stand By Me. So I love that aspect. And another thing it did that I really liked was it introduced the Mind Flayer. That was a perfect villain. It didn't just bring the Demogorgon back. It did give us the Demodogs, which was still pretty cool. It was like <laughs> the Hounds of Hell, but in Demogorgon form. But it gave us this larger-than-life villain in the Mind Flayer. So at the forefront of all these problems, you have the Demodogs, and our main cast are trying to deal with these things, and it ain't like in the first season where you had one Demogorgon that they were trying to defeat. 
but you've got an entire like army of these things. So that's bad enough, but then of course we do have the Mind Flayer and then they completely subverted my expectations because I expected the fight with the Mind Flayer to be like this big homage to the Kaiju films and him be this big monster that they're trying to defeat. But no, they went a different direction. They actually went more of a possession route where the Mind Flayer takes over Will. And I thought that was awesome because that's paying homage to the great classic possession films like The Exorcist. Mostly, I saw mostly The Exorcist, but I would even say maybe a little Pet Cemetery in there since obviously the Duffer Brothers are clearly fans of Stephen King, so that wouldn't surprise me if that wasn't in their mind. But anyways, the last thing I'm going to mention, and there's probably more things about this season that I like. I'm just naming like the main things that come to my mind. I could spend all day cherry picking and tearing this season apart for things I like and dislike, but I don't want to do that. But the last thing I'm going to mention, which I'm going to cheat because it's technically two characters, but I'm going to combine them to one since they're brother and sister. And that's Billy and Max, two of my favorite characters in this entire show. I love the way they handled Billy's character, which I'll get into in a little more detail when I discuss season three. But I really liked Max. I think she's actually one of the best things to happen to this show. I liked everyone else. I like all the other kids. I like Hopper and Joyce, but Max was awesome. I liked her character, and I'll get into her a little bit more when I get to season four. Major elephant in the room that everybody talks about when they think of this season is episode seven, The Lost Sister. And I actually really loved the concept they introduced. I just feel like it was a little bit of a half-baked plan that was more fully realized in season four, and it was obviously realized a lot better with the other kids in the Hawkins lab. But I still like the idea, and I liked the character of Callie. I would really like to see her come back. In fact, if they do bring her back and she has a bigger part to play in season five, I feel like if they handle it right, it could retroactively make episode seven better, if that makes sense. But on to my next, I guess you could call it a problem with this season. I don't know really what to call it because it's not a problem, air quotes. (laughs) It's very similar to the problem I have with Scream 2 in the Scream franchise. So it's technically a good movie. I mean, how could it not be? It's the same director, the same cast. It very closely mimicked the formula of the first movie. And in this case, the first season. But I think because it feels so much like the first season, just like Scream 2 felt so much like Scream 1, in my mind, and maybe it's more subconscious than anything, if I'm going to go back and watch either season, I'd rather watch the one that did it a little better, even if it's not much better. And yes, I understand, like I said, season 2 went bigger. It did. It definitely went bigger, but it still felt like season one very much. It married up to season one in a big way, very much like how Halloween 2 from 1981 married up to the first Halloween. But the problem with that is, for me, when I go back and rewatch these, I almost always just want to go back and watch season one if I'm looking for that atmosphere that seasons one and two bring. But if I'm looking for something a little more fun and a little more explosive, if you will, blockbuster-ish, I don't even know if that's a word, I go to seasons three or four. So for me, season two, I almost never go back and rewatch it unless I'm doing like a full marathon. And I guess that really is my only problem. I mean, like I said, all of these seasons are so good that I have very few issues with them, but this is a ranking and they all have to go somewhere. So season two goes in fourth place. But now I'm at my third place, and I think this is the one that might get me in trouble with some people. Even though I said don't take the number placement to heart because I love all seasons, I just know how people on the internet can be. And I think my pick for third place is going to make some people scratch their heads and maybe not even take my opinions on this show serious. (laughs) But for me... Personally, my number three spot is season one. I love this season. I watched it the very first week it dropped because my little sisters watched it, and they know I love horror movies and I'm into Stephen King and all that, so they were like, hey, you need to watch this show. So I went over to my parents' house and I watched it with them and I fell in love with it. I was like, dang, when's season two coming? And then I found out it was like a year away and I was so angry, (laughs) but I love this season. It had everything I wanted in not just a show, but even like a horror movie. It had atmosphere. It felt gritty. It had that 80s vibe. I literally felt like I was watching something that was filmed in the 80s. The chemistry between the kids was perfect. 
They felt like real kids. I mean, I was a 90s kid, but that even felt like me and my friends when we were kids, you know, running around town and hanging out and riding our bikes and going to arcades and stuff like that. That was still very much relevant in my childhood. And it, I guess for me, it was pretty nostalgic, but I think they handled all aspects of it perfectly. It was scary when it needed to be. It was funny when it needed to be. It was action-packed when it needed to be, but on a very grounded level. Obviously, we get to even season two, but especially seasons three and four, it gets larger than life. It's so grounded, even though we're dealing with monsters and other dimensions and government conspiracies, it still feels very grounded. It just felt like small-town America. And I loved the opening of the pilot episode. The first, I don't know, minute, maybe two minutes, where you see the guy running to the elevator and you know something's chasing him, but you don't know what it is. That is frightening. And then a little bit later, you know, right after that, it introduces the kids. And then, you know, right after that, when Will is riding home on his bike, he gets attacked by presumably the same monster. I mean, that's what you're assuming. And it was very chilling like that was genuinely scary stuff right there that's the stuff i like it they didn't show you everything and they definitely didn't show you too much and it really sets the stage for what's to come and what i really love about it is a lot of shows will have an amazing opening or intro but it sort of peters out and loses its traction after that and then it's you know a slow go getting back to that momentum but this show keeps you so invested from start to finish. I mean, from the moment that pilot episode starts until the very last episode of season one, you're just along for the ride, like you were totally there for it. And even when the show does slow down a little bit to give you these character moments, it does it right because you're invested into every character so much. Like when it's focusing on Joyce or Hopper, you're not upset that it's not focused on the kids and vice versa. When it's focused on Hawkins Lab, or the Demogorgon, you're not upset that it's not focusing on Jonathan and Nancy or Steve. It's like you're so equally invested in everything that you never care where the focus is at because you just love everything and everyone in it. And that's the part of this show that sold me the most. And another great aspect of this first season is that it's so self-contained and wraps itself up so perfectly that If they would have ended it right there at season one and never came back for a sequel, I would have been totally content. And I think a lot of other people would have been too. And it still would have probably been my favorite show ever. But obviously I know how the industry machine works and I knew that the first season was very successful. So obviously it was very likely that they were going to come back for a sequel. But because the first season was so good, I had mixed emotions. Like I said earlier, when I watched the first season, I was excited to see a second season because I wanted to see these characters and this world come back. But I did not want to see them put a blemish on an otherwise perfect series. And let's face it, sequels have a long running history of not being that good. But we got season two and obviously it was great. But as for any real negatives, I really don't have any. This season was perfect. And it's not that this season was missing anything. It's just simply that seasons three and four had things that popped for me a little bit more. And I'll be getting into that right now. And coming in at second place, and probably my second most controversial pick on this list, because obviously if you do process of elimination, you know which two seasons are left. And I think most people would put this at their number one. But for me, my number two is season four. Now hear me out. I love this season. I know I keep repeating this, but I really want everybody to understand every season is basically perfect. And what I really liked about this season, the things that I really felt like the Duffer Brothers got right, was Vecna himself. I mean, you can clearly see where their inspiration for this character came from. If you're a fan of Freddy Krueger or Pinhead or Pennywise, then you're going to love Vecna because they implemented elements of each one of these villains into Vecna. He invades your mind like Freddy. He capitalizes on your fear like Pennywise. The way he controls the upside down and the monsters down there is very reminiscent of Pinhead. They had a plan with this character, and they followed through with it, and it was perfect. And I love the way they tied it in with the previous three seasons. You can go back and watch those seasons now, and you can retroactively see where Vecna 
sort of was pulling the strings all along. They connected it so perfectly. Now, I've watched interviews, and it kind of, sometimes it kind of seems like, yeah, they had planned Vecna from the very beginning. Other times, now, I okay, so I watched an interview, and they said that before Netflix would red light this series, they basically wanted to know what was the upside down? What is the lore here? And so they wrote, like, they said it was like five pages. I could be wrong. If I am, you can correct me in the comments, but basically a bunch of pages worth of material just explaining what the upside down is. So I'm sure that they had an idea of Vecna from the beginning. I just don't know if they knew exactly what that was going to look like and how that was going to translate to screen when they finally got there. But they tied it in perfectly. So I <laughs> I would not be surprised if he was planned from the very beginning, but but I digress. So another character that I really loved in this season, and this is like the stereotypical answer. <laughs> if you ask anybody what they liked about Stranger Things 4, they're probably going to tell you Vecna and Max. I thought Max was definitely the standout of this season. I've liked her in every season. I mean, ever since the moment she was introduced, I've loved her character. I thought it was a good addition, but she truly went above and beyond for this season. The way she handled emotional scenes and missing her brother and dealing with the trauma of what happened to her brother and everything that happened from season three, I mean, she sold it. She sold me. You can tell, like, just from her acting, she really sells you on the fact that this is a broken character. Like everything that she's been through and that she's seen has all culminated to make her the person she is in this season. She still loves all of her friends and you actually come to find out that the memories she has with Lucas and the rest of the kids are her best memories in her entire life. So it makes it that much more heartbreaking when you realize that she's trying to push them away, not because she doesn't like them, but because she doesn't know how to handle what's going on in her head and Vecna is capitalizing on this. And in some ways, if you ask me, I know I said that Vecna was kind of a hodgepodge of all these different villains throughout the years from these classic movies, but in some ways, I think he was done better because there is a serious emotional conflict here, even for the audience, because you love these characters so much. So when you see how broken it is, everybody's, well, separated, just like the song Separate Ways, you know, <laughs> that was actually a really good song to use for this show. And I know I'm getting off track here, but that song was perfect for that reason. But anyways, <laughs> back to Max. Loved her character. Thought she, I don't even know how she could have done it better because she was that good. But everybody was good. I mean, I felt like Jonathan was kind of worthless this season, and I'm not sure what that was all about. I'm hoping they do more with him in season five because I've always liked him. But... Mike was fine. Um, Will was fine. Dustin was awesome, as usual. I like him from every season. He's just kind of a constant. But I liked how they reintroduced Owens because, you know, he wasn't really in season three. He was in the last episode for like a minute or less. They brought back they brought back Brenner. That's tough to say. And I liked it. Now, we all knew he was alive. There was that line in season two where... The guy tells Elle and Callie that Brenner is still alive. So between that and a couple of other things said throughout the previous two seasons, I pretty much knew and I think everybody pretty much knew that Brenner was alive. We just didn't know when or how he was going to come back or what that was going to look like. But they brought him back in a good way. And I like that they added layers to him. And another thing, speaking of him, it made me think of this that I really, really, really liked about this season is... One of the major themes, and I don't know how many other people have noticed this because I've never even heard anybody else talk about it. One of the things I felt like the Duffer brothers were really trying to convey here is that their show is going to be more complex than a lot of TV shows. It's not just as simple as you have good guys and you have bad guys because real life doesn't really work like that. I mean, there are some people who are exceptionally bad people, obviously, but overall, the world is just full of people, and people make good and bad choices, sometimes for the right reasons, sometimes for selfish reasons. But there was an emphasis on that, and it tried to show us that, yes, Brenner did some really bad things, but he did them with what he thought were good intentions. And I feel like the complexity of that was really hammered home in this season in a very good and effective way. But... This is a ranking video where I'm going through and kind of explaining everything, so I guess I have to also let everybody know why it's number two and not number one. And there really aren't any major problems with this season. Just like with seasons one and two, 
basically any complaints I have are just nitpicks. But one thing that did stand out to me is something that I wasn't overly fond of is the little love triangle between Jonathan, Nancy, and Steve. I mean, they spent the first three seasons and especially the first two seasons building up this eventual relationship between Nancy and Jonathan. Now, I'll admit, I was kind of surprised when Nancy and Steve ended up back together at the end of season one. I really thought her and Jonathan were going to get together in that season by the end of it, but they didn't go that route. They once again subverted our expectations because But my guess is they had that planned all along. Like they probably knew if Netflix greenlit a second season, they were going to keep building on that and ultimately put Nancy and Jonathan together. And then they did. And then in season three, they have a little bit of a rocky road there for a little bit because, you know, Jonathan didn't trust Nancy when she had a hunch and knew that something wasn't right about those rats. But they resolved that. And at the end... She's heartbroken that he's moving. You know, he doesn't want to really go. And, you know, there's some genuinely heartfelt moments there between those two. And I just thought, okay, they're together. And I love Steve. In fact, he is another one of just my favorite characters. And I think he's one of most people's favorite characters. But I want to see him with somebody else. I wanted to see him with Robin, but then they took her character a different direction, which, you know, that's something I'll get into more when I get to season three. But... I don't feel like Nancy and Steve are really a good match. I feel like Jonathan and Nancy are a great match. And I feel like you're basically cheapening everything they went through in the first two seasons to get together and then what they went through to stay together in the third season. So I feel like messing with that in any capacity is just bad. And I I don't want to say bad because I still like the season, but I don't want to see a love triangle between those three. I just want Jonathan and Nancy to live happily ever after, and I want Steve to end up with someone great, and he can have his happily ever after. But other than that, I really don't have anything negative I can say about this season. I mean, I don't just want to sit here and nitpick because that doesn't really seem authentic. So I'm going to leave it at that and move on. But here it is, folks, my number one. And I don't know how controversial this will be. I haven't watched a lot of ranking videos for Stranger Things, so I and I, I don't really follow the community that much, which is kind of surprising since it is my favorite show. But for me, personally, my favorite season, and if you did Process of Elimination, you already know what it obviously is, is season three. And my reasons for that are very simple. I have a couple of reasons. One, I remember how awesome the marketing was for this season. I mean, you just knew going into this, it was going to be big, bigger than anything we had seen before. You saw the Mind Flayer in the trailer, and I remember going, what the heck is that thing? And I was just excited. I was probably more pumped for season three than I was season four. I was mostly only anticipating season four so much because, for one, it was like, where do we pick up after season three? Everybody split apart. You know, what's going to happen next? And the fact that they left us hanging for three years or something like that. But season three, in my opinion, had the best marketing. So there was that. I went into it with a positive notion. But... Another big one, and this is obviously entirely subjective to just me. I mean, opinions on TV shows and movies are always subjective anyways, but this even more so because a lot of my love for this season comes from nostalgia. I was in a very good place when this season came out. I was very happy. In fact, probably the happiest I've been in maybe my whole life. So I was in a good place when it came out. So I always have those good nostalgic memories when I go back and rewatch it, which is a lot. But the other thing is, it just felt like the big summer blockbusters that we always got in the 80s and 90s, back even before we got all the superhero movies. Like, I remember when the summer hit, you always had these big, larger-than-life blockbusters. And this felt like that, especially dropping on July 4th. I remember me and my girlfriend at the time came down to visit my family and... We all had a great time and we stayed up the entire night watching this season and I remember just loving it so much. So there's that. But I also loved how happy all the characters were in the beginning. You know, I heard the Duffer brothers say in an interview that the first two seasons were them basically building their universe, building their world, establishing the characters. 
They knew that ultimately season four was going to start to be where all the revelations come in with the upside down and, you know, with Vecna and all that. But season three, they had already built their world. They had their characters. They referred to season three as them playing in their sandbox. And I loved that because that is what season three was. It was just explosive and fun. They didn't give us any new lore. They didn't expand it in that way, but they took what they already had and they utilized it in the best way possible. At the beginning, all the characters are together. The relationships are healthy. Everybody's happy. And I love that. And that makes it so much more sad whenever, you know, we get to the end and everything just falls apart and we lose Billy, who was one of my favorite characters. And him, very much like Steve, had a great character arc. In fact, Steve and Billy are my two favorite character arcs in the entire series. I think they had the best character development because at, you know, their starting points in the series, they're both jerks. Um, Steve isn't nearly as bad as Billy, but they were both pretty bad. And then you start to learn, well, with Steve, you know, it's his relationship with Nancy that kind of helps open his eyes. But with Billy, you see a little bit of his home life in season two. You know he doesn't have the best home life. And then in three, we learn that his upbringing wasn't that great. His mom left. His dad was abusive. And so that doesn't justify his actions, but it makes you connect with him a little bit more on a realistic human nature. It humanizes him and it makes you sympathize for him a little bit more. You don't justify or excuse anything he's done, but at the same time, you kind of get it. And I liked that. And when he died, I'll admit, <laughs> I had tears in my eyes. Um, I like what they did with Steve. He finally acknowledges, at least in this season, that him and Nancy are no good for each other. He finally listens to Dustin and tries to get with Robin, who was uh, introduced in this season. And another great, it's like the Duffer brothers don't know how to mess up a character. Like they, they literally don't know how to do it. The worst character in the show is still great, but they gave Robin a lot to do in her introductory. And I love her character. Just awesome. But, you know, we find out that she's obviously not into... Steve, <laughs> she is into women. And I like that Steve accepted that so well. Like, it doesn't even phase him. In fact, the only problem he has with it is who she had a crush on. <laughs> I, You know, it showed that he genuinely cared for her. Like, even if he couldn't be with her, he still wanted the best for her. And I think that was awesome, especially when you look at Steve from the first half of season one and then compare that to where we're at now. You realize, wow, this Steve's awesome. But then we get Erica, and I love the little group that they put together with Dustin and Steve and Erica and Robin. I thought that was awesome. And I really liked that they finally just went there with the Russian thing. You know, in the first two seasons, you know, obviously, if you know anything about the 80s, you know that the Cold War was going on, and you know that Brenner was using Eleven to spy on the Soviets. But we never actually encounter Russians, and in season three, we do, and I think that's so cool, and I really like the references and homages that this season pays to spies like us, especially with the elevator scene. I mean, I don't know how many people caught that, but the elevator scene where they all get in the elevator, and then it just drops, and then they realize, okay... There's some bad stuff going on here. There was a little callback to Spies Like Us, and I actually really liked that movie, but I think those four had the best chemistry of any group in season three. You know, you had Mike and Will and Luke, and at some point they connect and, you know, with Eleven and Max, and that's fun. I mean, that's always fun. The characters are always good, but Erica... Robin, Dustin, and Steve were the standouts of this season, but I even like the pairing of Joyce and Hopper, especially when they link up with Murray and Alexi. And Alexi was the character that died this season. Every season, the Duffers introduce a new character that everybody falls in love with and then kills them off. It's kind of a trope at this point. Hopefully, that's something that they will use to subvert our expectations in the fifth season. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But at this point, we just go into a Stranger Things season expecting that. But I really liked Alexi, and I was really upset when he died. And I think the reason why is because if you truly understand what was going on in Russia with the Soviet Union in the 80s, you know that they didn't have very many freedoms. So, when Alexi comes to America, the simple things like going into a convenience store and buying a Coke and drinking it or going to the fair and getting a corn dog and winning a prize, things like that are new experiences for him. He's like a little kid waking up on Christmas morning and 
seeing all the toys there and not even really knowing where to begin because he's just so pumped. And then he dies. <laughs> that was a bummer. I really liked him. But, you know, like I said, that's just something you expect out of Stranger Things at this point. And as far as any negatives go, I do actually have one. And it's something that, despite this being my favorite season, I really didn't like that they did this. So I was okay with them bringing Hopper back in season four. I thought that there was a chance they probably would anyway. But I think we could have done without the post credit scene on the last episode of Stranger Things. Because I think we all pretty much knew who the Russian guard was referring to when he said the American. And I feel like that just showed their hand way too early. I think the Duffer brothers should have held on to that and made that like a big surprise in season four. Because even though we all probably assumed Hopper was coming back, we really didn't know. But when they showed that post credit scene, it's like, OK, who else could it be? But, you know, I digress. If that's the only complaint I have for this season, then it's doing pretty good. And as you can see, it's doing really good because it's my favorite season. But that's all I really had to say, guys. It's a great series. And just like all of you, I am super excited and pumped for season five. But that's it for this video, guys. That's my ranking of the Stranger Things series. I would love to hear yours. Post it down in the comments section and let's discuss it. In the meantime, go ahead and like and share this video. If you haven't already, please subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next one.